Good morning. How you guys doing? Good. Good to see you all today. So I suppose everybody's had some interesting jobs in their life. Um, I used to work at this place called AltSource, like Alternative Source, and it was a place where we rebuilt heavy equipment components. So we tore down old machines, we sold parts, we rebuilt stuff like hydraulics and, uh, you know, uh, these uh, transmissions and drop boxes and differentials. I don't even know if you know all those terms, but just big pieces that went to heavy equipment. And the heavy equipment, the construction equipment, is that stuff you see on the side of the road. You know, when you're driving on this lot and you see this like big bulldozer or a big dump truck or a big backhoe, the yellow equipment, that's the kind of stuff that we worked on. And um, I, one day I was working and I was kind of the foreman of the shop and uh, we had so much work that some days it was, uh, it was great because we were working hard, but some days we were trying to get it all done because when someone's machine is down, it's costing them a lot of time when they're not working on that project, right? And if you're the owner of a home that's trying to be built, you know how it is, right? You're pressuring them to get it done and they have a deadline and so they're losing money. And so it was always a hustle and bustle to get those components rebuilt and get them out back to the customer. And I remember one day it was so, so busy. I had so many things logged in for that day. I mean, there was one particular thing we were trying to do, and that was to get this giant transmission from a, nine, a 992 loader, a cat machine, a, a caterpillar. This is one of those. This is the same model. And you can see how big it is. You need a couple of stairways, right, just to get up into the cab. So you can imagine you're smaller probably than one of those tires right there. That's how, you know, you're about six feet maybe. You might barely get to the top of that. So this thing is, this machine is huge. The transmission is out of it. And so we picked it up at a shop that was kind of like a partner of ours. And, uh, I had to go bring it down to a guy who was going to test it on a dyno. Uh, a dyno is, a, they, they hook it up and they make sure it can shift and do all this stuff. They bring it up to speed. So you're just checking to see if it works right. So it's at the end of the day. And my boss goes, hey, John, did you bring that transmission down to the guy, you know, our shop? And I'm like, oh, man, no, I didn't. And now there's like about 20 minutes left in the day. And, and he's like, you know, you're always over committing. You're always saying you can do it and you can't get it done. Of course, something inside of me just like triggered because I'm like, man, I'm working hard. I can do this. You know what I said? And I said to him these famous last words that probably a lot of people say is like, I don't care if I am being prideful. I'm going to go bring that down. Now, you got to understand something. I had a pickup. We had a truck pickup and we used to get sometimes if something was so big, you had to get like what they call a low boy to move a, a big giant piece of equipment or a flatbed truck that could handle the weight. Well, we're trying to bring this tr transmission. Go ahead, flip to it. That's how big that transmission is. That's a picture of that transmission. This thing weighs close to 4,000 pounds. Okay, that's a lot, all right? And except it wasn't on a stand at the time. It was just kind of laying there. And so I go by with the pickup that we have, and it's a one ton. That means you can do about 2,000 pounds, okay? So I'm about 2,000 pounds short of what this pickup can actually do. But I'm like, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to get this thing done. I'm just so determined in my mind. I don't want to like, you know, be the person who can't, who over promises and can't deliver. So I take my pickup and I go over to the shop where it's sitting on the ground. It's outside. So we have an outside forklift with these giant tires. We scoop it up. We put it in the bag of the pickup and you just watch that pickup go like, all right, you know, you've ever seen them overloaded. And then these guys are like, hey, do you want to strap it down? And I'm like, well, to be honest, I'm only going two miles with this thing. And, you know, that thing is so heavy, I doubt it's even going to move. So we put it in the pickup, and I'm driving out. Now I get out onto the main road. It's a little road and a little access road. Now I'm going to get onto the main road. And it's kind of one of those ones where you can merge. You don't really have to sit there for the light. It's got that little thing. And I'm crawling. I'm probably going 20 miles an hour. I'm going so slow. And as I'm starting to go around this gradual turn, I feel the pickup go like this. And then it goes like that back. And I'm out here, bam. And I look in my side view mirror and there's the transmission out on the middle of the road. And the back, I'm like, what happened? And I look at the pickup, you know, pickups, the side of the walls of the pickup are like this. Well, my one side's like this now. It literally just crushed it and rolled right over. And I'm like, oh my God, what am I going to do? Thank God I had like a radio for the guys in the shop right there. They come rolling out with this pick, forklift, scoop it up before the police can even get there, you know, because I'm like, I'm going to get a citation for this. And they take it back. And then I have to embarrassingly drive back to our shop with the pickup, with the side of the pickup sitting out like this. It was like $2,000 worth of damage. I had to replace the whole bed of the pickup. And I'm like, oh my goodness. 
I felt so embarrassed, you know, and I was like, and I'm thinking now, I'm so glad it wasn't strapped to the truck or I probably would have been sitting on the side of the road with a pickup on its side. I don't know. Maybe that was God. I'm not sure. I don't know if God like, like comes through when you're in your prideful moments or not, but I'm just thanking God anyway that I made it back. So, man, I was so embarrassed. And, you know, that's what kind of happens when you try to take the shortcut. I was like, I'm just going to make it happen. I know I should use a bigger vehicle. I should wait to get the flatbed. I need to, you know, strap it down. Probably shouldn't do this. But I was taking the shortcut, and it bombed. And I, and I learned that day, what probably a lot of us probably have learned, is that when you do something halfway, it probably is not really going to work out, right? That's what we, we kind of know. But something, sometimes doing something halfway, I don't know why, but it's very tempting, isn't it? It's tempting. I think that we have the hope, is, what we're, is the truth, is we have the hope that if we just kind of do it halfway, that somehow we're going to get full results, right? It happens so much in life because there's this promise that compromise has in our life because we're going to compromise. We're just not going to do the whole thing. That, so there's this promise that it's somehow it's going to deliver, that it's going to be easier, but we're going to get everything that we really want out of life. But the truth is that hardly ever happens. Let me see if you guys can complete this sentence for me. If it's too good to be true... I don't know, that was a mix. <laughs> that was really mixed. But it, it's mostly, I heard it out there. But if it's too good to be true, it's not, right? It isn't. It ain't, right? We have different ways of finishing that sentence, but we all kind of know that if it's too good to be true, it isn't. See, we already know that it doesn't work out in our lives, but why do we still attempt them? We still tempt them anyway. Somehow, we still believe, hope after hope, that it's going to work out. I mean, we hear a story about somebody who hit it big, and they just got lucky, and we think, that's going to be me. If I keep doing it, I'm just going to happen. Or we hear the success story of someone who became famous overnight, but then if we really look into it, we realize that this person has been at it for like 10 or 20 years, right? They've been studying like these actors or actresses, and that they went to some school in New York, and that they played all these clubs, and they worked in these plays, off-Broadway plays, and that they did all these advertisements on TV, and then finally they get their break, and we think, wow, they just showed up on the scene, not realizing all the stuff that went to behind it. You know, and I think that's why we like to play the lottery a lot, right? Because we're hoping that it's going to bring a life of leisure in our lives. Did you know that annually that there are seven billion dollars spent by people on the lottery? Seventy, I meant seven, I meant seventy, I said seven, right? Seventy billion dollars. I mean, that's a huge budget. And the hope is that we're going to not ever have to work another day in our lives if we win it. So we play it hoping, well, this is the shortcut to what I want to get. There's a study that was made in Florida, and uh, 70% of people in Florida who win the lottery have spent every last dime of what they won in five years. <laughs> in five years. So if you think you're going to win the lottery and it's going to set you up for life, 70% of the people have found out it doesn't work. <laughs> and the reason it probably hasn't worked, this is just some extra, is probably because we never learned how to manage the money in the first place. And so then we get it all and we spend it and not realizing maybe if we just worked on how we spent our money, then maybe it would work out better. You see, the half fruit is so enticing, but it rarely works out. The truth is, you usually get only what you put in, right? You only get out of something what you put into something. Half the work produces half the results. And I put this in your outline. So if you got your outline with you, just pull it out with me for a moment. And I want you to fill it out because it's going to help you uh, stay connected to the message. But half measures produce half results in our lives. That's what it generally happens in almost every area of our life. That's the trade-off. Less work for inferior results. That's what we're going to get. And it's just kind of a general rule of life. And the truth is, the same thing happens in our relationship with God. Even though it happens everywhere in life, we somehow think that it's going to be different when it comes to God, don't we? Somehow we think, okay, God, you're just going to give me a pass on this one. It's kind of like we just think, well, he'll understand, right? We're not going to do it, but we'll understand. And, uh, and we still think he's going to show up. I mean, after all, he's a benevolent God. He's a good God. He's a forgiving God. So when we make mistakes, he's going to kind of give us a pass. And, and when we go into our relationship with a half heart, it's going to produce half spiritual work or development in our lives. That's the truth. But sometimes we don't see it clearly right up front. And the problem is we want everything, right? Why would we do this in our lives with God, give him only half, hoping he's going to give us 100%. And I think sometimes because God is the guy who created the universe, right? He's the guy with all the power. And we think, God, you can do it all. 
So why would we only give him half? Because nobody here thinks, I only want half of what God wants for me. Has anybody ever thought that in your life? Have you ever thought, I only want half a healing? I only want half of, uh, of the blessing in your life. I only want to be half restored or half restoration. I only want to have half the transformation, God, that you want to do in my life. None of us think that way. No, we want it all. I want it all, okay? If you don't, I'll have your share because I want all that God has for me. So today we're going to learn something about compromise in our lives and how it is that we can avoid compromise. So we're in the series, The Good Life, uh, Learning to Live Like Jesus. And it's a look at the gospel of, of of Mark, and we're seeing the life of Jesus through his eyes. And we're watching and we're learning about the life of Jesus. I mean, we've got box seats to all of the healings. We're right there in the midst of it, watching exactly what Jesus is doing. And we're also hearing all the conversation, all the instruction that's going to his disciples. When they're behind closed doors, we're right there like a fly on the wall, listening to it all. And we're getting an insider's view of how Jesus meant for us to live. And so today, Jesus encounters this bunch of guys, and, and they look like they've got it all together. I mean, they appear to be doing everything right. They're so good that no one else could compare to them. And these were the guys that everyone wanted to be like. And so we're going to pick it up in verse 1 of chapter 7. It says this, Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having from, come from Jerusalem. Now when they saw some of the disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, Without, with unwashed hands, they found fault. So they come up upon Jesus, they're watching him eat some food, and they haven't washed their hands. They're like, wow, you're defiled. You're, that's not cool. And for the Pharisees and all the Jews, uh, do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups and pitchers and copper vessels and couches. Then the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? So they come up upon Jesus and they're watching these guys eat and they're not washing their hands like they do. Now these guys, remember, they were like the perfectionists, right? So they're like, we do it. Why aren't you doing it? They're looking on, right? And they're like, this is the first check, right? You're, you're, you got a problem. The Pharisees were a group of guys, and they kind, of, they kind of came up, they originated between the Old Testament and the New Testament. There's about 400 years where the last prophet speaks, and then we have nothing until the Gospels, until Jesus shows up on the scene. And it's in this time that they show up, and the Pharisee, the word Pharisee simply meant separated ones. We're, we're, we're separating ourselves from the rest of the world so that we can be closer to God. And they devoted themselves to keeping even the minutest detail of the law and the tradition of the others, elders because they had good intentions. They started off good. We want to make sure we don't break the commandment. And so we're thinking about all these things that help us keep the commandment. And if there was somebody that was committed, okay, it was these guys. And we could say it was them because they even prescribed ways of washing their hands so to make sure that they were clean, so that they wouldn't be undefiled. In fact, they would wash meticulously before every meal. So every time they were about to eat, and even sometimes between the courses in a meal, so if they got up or they were waiting for dessert, they would re-wash their hands. And so the first time they would take the jug of water, they would pour it on their hands with their fingertips up so that the water could kind of drench down, moving all the dirt away from them. And then they would put their hands down, so their fingers down, and pour again over their hands to wash the dirt away. And then they would take their fists and wash their hands with their fists in this very, very this prescribed manner to make sure that their hands were clean. I mean, they were very meticulous about it. And when they would come in off the street into their homes, they would also wash. They'd wash their hands again because you never knew when you're walking through the streets if you bumped into a Gentile, that was a non-Jewish person, or if you bumped into somebody who worshipped other gods or a Samaritan who they didn't like, or if there was somebody who was unclean. So they said, just in case we come home, they'd wash again. And then they had 35 pages, by the way, in their own oral tradition, which was called the Mishnah, which was part of the Talmud. Don't mean to confuse you guys, but the Talmud, if you will. They had 35 pages on how to wash your pots and pans. Okay, and some of you thought your spouse was anal when it came to how they, how they put their, their dishes in the dishwasher, right? You're like, I thought you were crazy. You should have seen them. They would have been like, oh, no, that isn't right at all. That needs to be recleaned. I mean, 35 pages on how to wash a plate is insane. And so when they see this rabbi and his disciples not washing, they got a problem with it. 
They're like, are you kidding me? Have you read the 35 pages? I mean, maybe you haven't seen everything, but that's not the way we do it, right? And they're looking on at these guys thinking, wow, why do your, your disciples not wash their hands? And so Jesus responds like this. He answered and said to them, well, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And in vain, they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things you do. He said to them, all too well, you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and mother. So he's about to give them an example here. And he says, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is korban, that means uh, that is a gift to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother, making the word of God no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down, and many such things you do. So Jesus is like, you're questioning us here about like washing our hands, but maybe you forgot something <laughs> because you're so focused on your traditions that that's not part of the commandment, the Old Testament. It's not there. He's like, it's like you, 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 you're so focusing on this, you don't even realize that that's not part of God's law. You see, they were going after the things that they had written. They had written the Talmud, all these Pharisees. They were like, okay, these are the ways you keep the law. This is the way you keep yourself pure. This is the way you keep yourself from being undefiled or unclean. And they wrote all of this attachment to what God had prescribed in the Bible. And he says, that's not even what God has asked us to do. And see, the whole point of the tradition that they had written, again, I said it was for the right reason. They wanted to keep the command. They wanted to honor God. But they just went too far. In fact, it became easier for them to focus on the rules than to focus on God himself. And so if you're following along in your outline, you can write this down, compromise won't lead you to where you want to go. You see, it started to lead them away from where they wanted to be because they kept compromising. You see, if the rules were the way uh, to God, then it would have led them to God, wouldn't it have? Think about it. If all their tradition was to lead them to God, then that's where it should have led them. But here it is, they're blinded to God because the Messiah is standing right in front of them and they don't even see it. The Messiah was the culmination of all the Old Testament in this one guy. They're like, all of it points to him. He's standing in front of you, and you can't even see it because your rules have led you far away. All they saw was some unclean disciples and a rabbi who wouldn't wash his hands. That's all they saw. They couldn't see the Messiah. They couldn't see the Son of God standing right there. He was unclean in their eyes because that's what their rules told them, and their rules got in the way. And check out, Matthew adds a little bit to the story. He has the same kind of scene, and he says this. Jesus says to them, look at, ignore them, he's telling the crowd. Just ignore them. They are blind guides leading the blind. And if one blind person guides another, they will both fall into a ditch. Don't follow them, because if you follow them, they're like blind guides, and you'll be blind, and you'll fall into a ditch too. The man-made traditions have become a distraction from the original purpose or intent. And so they became so focused on the minutia and the details that they began keeping rules for the sake of keeping the rules, not for the sake of God. And that's where they began to mess up. And so Jesus says it's not only becoming a problem that not leading you to God, but it's also devolving into compromising what God originally wanted for you. And he pulls out this little illustration. He says, he uses this word korban. He said, because they practice this tradition, korban simply meant that it was dedicated to God. And so to, very, to, to appear, and maybe not just to appear, but if you wanted to like honor God in some way, let's say your cow had twins, right? And you go like, oh, my cow had twins. I want to dedicate one of these cows to God. So it's like, it was Corban now. You weren't maybe required to do it, but he said you could declare whatever you wanted as a dedication to God. And so some of them did that because of a pure heart. They wanted to do that. And some of them just wanted to appear like they were really awesome and close to God. And the thing about Corban is if you declared a Corban, it was like dedicated to God, but you didn't necessarily have to give it to God. You could kind of at your end of your life, give it to God. And he's like, so he starts saying to them, look at you guys got a problem with this Corban thing. You keep dedicating things to God so that you don't have to give it other places. Because they were breaking one of the top 10 rules, you know, the 10 commandments, right? Number five is honor your father and mother. And what it meant to honor your father and mother is that when they had a need, 
especially when they got older, you were supposed to take care of them. But he says, but you don't take care of them because you said it's Corban. All that you have is dedicated to God and you skip the law. You compromise the law, which was to take care of the people that you love and that you should be taking care of your family. And instead you say, oh no, it's dedicated to God. And so you compromise and you get out of it. And he calls them out on this practice of what they were doing. You see, they use the rules to justify compromising the word of God. It's a problem that didn't start that way, but that's what com- compromise does, right? Their rules weren't there to compromise the law, but over time, that's what happened. Because it doesn't ta- compromise doesn't take you away immediately. And that's part of the, that's part of the draw of compromise. It's like, well, it's just a little bit. It's not a big deal. It's not going to affect everything in our lives. And that's the subtle deception of what compromise does in our lives. It tricks us into thinking that it's okay. Well, it's just a little thing. I can just take that transmission down. It's only two miles. It's never going to fall out of that pickup. I'll get it there. It'll be done. I can compromise even though this equipment is not equipped to handle it. But it slowly and slowly leads us away. Not in the beginning, but slowly will lead us away from where you're trying to get. This son asked his mom one day, can I go see a rated R movie? Now they had a rule in their house Look at you're under 18, you're under a certain age, you can't go see a rated R movie. That's just what they set for their, their house. And so he's like, look, can I go see this movie, please? Everybody is seeing this movie. Every kid in my class is seeing it. I'm the only one who hasn't seen it. I'm super embarrassed because I haven't seen it. And she's like, well, okay, well, why is it rated R? Well, there's this one little scene in there. You know, there's one scene and it's just, it's only a tiny scene. It's not a big deal. It really doesn't affect the whole movie. It's not like the whole movie is. It's just this one little bit. So the mother thinks about it and she goes, all right, I'll tell you what, I'll let you watch this movie. In fact, I'll let you watch this movie at our house with your friends and we'll invite them all over. And even so, and even that, I'll make you your favorite brownies. So the kids come all over, they're watching the movie, and they're, they're having a great time, and the mom starts making the brownies, and as she's making the mix, she walks out into the yard, and she sees a little bit of dog poop out there, and she takes just the tiniest little bit of dog poop, and she puts it in and mixes it in with the kids' favorite brownies, and she bakes the brownies, and she brings them into the living room, and she goes, oh, hey, I got your favorite brownies for you, and they're like, yeah, awesome, and he goes, okay, but I got to tell you one thing, there's just a tiny bit of dog poop in there. <laughs> It's not much. It's just the tiniest. You won't even taste it. It won't even affect you. <laughs> How many of them do you think would eat one of those brownies? Who here would eat those brownies, right? But it's only a little bit. You know, when we look at it that way, it's kind of clear that compromise in our lives, they can have a bigger effect in our life than we really think it would. And that's the thing. Compromise, it tricks us. Because a little poop affects the whole bunch, right? We know that. That's what the Bible says. Listen to what the Bible says. Put up the next verse, please. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Leaven is yeast. That's all it is. Leaven is another term for yeast. And when you were baking, your, your bread won't rise. The, the wheat and everything won't rise. It'll be flat. There'll be no, no, no volume to it. So you add a tiny bit of yeast into it. And when you add the yeast into it and you mix it up and you let it sit for a while, then it swells, right? That's the yeast permeating the whole thing. And he's saying just that a little bit of compromise affects the whole thing. See, a baker puts that in and it rises. And that's what compromise did to these Pharisees. There is like this, there's this tragic sequence that happens and it's actually in your outline. If you do have the outline on that first page, we just read it, but I put bold the sequence if you'll look at it. So you can underline it if you want, you can number it or do whatever you want. But the first thing they do is they teach the doctrines as commandments, right? They start by taking their doctrines and they teach it as the word of God. And then the next thing that happens is when they start to do that, well, when I got these, they lay aside the word of God, lay aside the commandment of God. So now I got these, I don't need the commandment of God. And then the next thing that happens, because they've done that, they reject the commandment of God. Notice the progression. We didn't start out that way. We started out the way we wanted it to go, but instead it got worse and worse in their life. And then if you flip the page and you'd read the next part, they start rejecting the word of God until finally making the word of God of no effect. The word of God had no effect in their lives. None of us here want to think that God's not going to have effect in our lives, right? But sometimes that one little bit of compromise begins to grow like yeast, permeating everything. And before you know it, we're like, wait a minute, how did I get here? God, I don't understand. I don't feel connected to you. Lord, I don't see you working in my life. And we haven't realized 
that those little steps have led us to a point where God can no longer be powerful the way he wants to be in our lives. I guess the question to ask at this moment is where are we compromising in life? Do you know how you know if you're compromising in, in, in an area of your life? Because sometimes we're like, well, I'm not sure. It's any place that we say this. It's okay. God will understand. Have you ever said that? I mean, we probably, I've never said, I don't know if I've ever said it out loud, to be honest, but I know I've said it in my head. Like, all right, God, I know I don't want to, okay, I'm just going to do it. It's going to be okay. It'll be okay. It's just this once, right? We say that. And we know that if we can think of that area in our lives, then we know, hey, man, maybe this is the area, maybe this is the part, this little place where I've been compromising. Because when we do that, it's going to rob us of the power of God in our lives. God doesn't want that for you. I don't want that for you. And none of us want that for ourselves. But it also should be telling us something about our hearts, that there's something more important than God in that area. And that's where we go next. Listen to Jesus. He says, when he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, hear me, everyone, and understand. There's nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. When he had entered a house away from the crowd, the disciples asked him concerning the parable. So he said to them, are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods? And he said, what comes out of a man, that defiles a man. From within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. After like kind of chastising the Pharisees, right, you blind guides and everything, then he kind of turns and takes an opportunity to just talk to the crowds that's there. The thing that defiles a person is not what goes into the body. You see, you're worried that my dirty hands are going to dirty the food that goes in me and I'm going to be defiled, he says. But that doesn't happen because it just goes through your body and then it just comes right back out. So to look at the Pharisees, if we were to look at them, we would have said they have it all together. I mean, you guys do everything perfect. You got everything down to the, the last, you know, dot your T's, cross your, cross your T's, dot your I's, right? We would have said, look, at these guys are all in, right? They're so committed. They're all in. I mean, what further could they have done? What more could you guys be doing to stay close to God? And they took the law to the whole new level. But the problem is they were only focused on the outward appearance. It didn't tell the whole story. And the outside appearance never tells the whole story. So Jesus points out that they're using their traditions to make themselves look holy. He uses this term hypocrites. We read it in the verse before. And the hypocrite was, was just a Greek term, hip, hypocrites. And it meant that you were an actor or you were a stage player. And so if you were an actor then at those times and you were called a hypocrite, that was like a huge compliment. You're such an amazing hypocrite, right? And we don't say that today, but they'd be like, oh, thank you very much, you know? I did do well, didn't I? You know, but if you were to say that to like the Pharisees, they were like, that's an insult, okay? As it is today, right? We're insults. Someone calls you a hypocrite. You're like, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. And they're saying, you're just playing an act with God. That's what you're doing when you said hypocrite. You're just, you're just fooling around. You're, you're playing. You look the part, but inside it's not, it's different. The outside's not telling the full story. You see, when we get the inside right, then the outside will be right. And that's the next part of your, your outline, the next fill-in. God has everything. He has everything when he has your heart. You see, you can give him the outside, and you can change your behavior. You can do all sorts of things. But if he doesn't have the heart, then he doesn't have everything. But if he has your heart, then he'll get all the rest, everything that you do. You see, they, they were so focused on cleanliness. And why? Why are they focused on cleanliness? Because maybe we're looking on and we're just saying, yeah, it's good to wash your hands. I love to wash my hands way before I eat because I don't want to get junk on them. I tell my kids to wash their hands and sometimes their faces or blow their nose, right? I'm telling them to do all these things so they're going to stay healthy and not have a problem. But what was the deal here? Because it was really about spiritual cleanliness that they were talking about, not washing to make them spiritually uh, unclean. That's what they thought. You're not washing, so not that you're not clean, but you're spiritually unclean, which is a whole new step that God had never talked about. Just because your body is dirty doesn't mean that you're spiritually unclean. You see, according to the law in the Old Testament, there were many things that made a person unclean. 
If you were unclean, though, it meant this, that you couldn't approach the temple of God and you couldn't fellowship with other people who were worshipers of God. You had to say you were unclean. You had to remove yourself for a period of time until you could become spiritually clean again by bringing a sacrifice or repenting to God. So the whole idea of uncleanliness had to do with the heart more than it had to do with whether they had dirt on them or not. A person was made right with God before a relationship could be established. That's what it meant to be unclean. You had to be made right before you could reestablish that relationship. But their man-made rules had nothing to do with spiritual cleanliness. Think about it. And it was just a big act. It caused them to lose perspective on what was most important because special cleansing of hands and cups and plates and utensils may remove dirt from those things, but it can't clean your soul. It couldn't make them clean inside. And they're thinking, well, if we wash, then you'll be clean inside. And, they're, and Jesus is looking on, guys, you guys miss it. You're missing it entirely because it's not about that. They took a symbol, a symbol of cleanliness, spiritual cleanliness, and said, and took that and mistook it for something they thought could make them right in front of God's eyes when that symbol was supposed to lead you back to God. If you felt unclean, you were supposed to go back to God. But they thought, well, if you just keep cleaner, then that's going to make you right in front of God. And that's why Jesus says, whatever goes into your body comes back out. It doesn't affect your heart. It doesn't affect your soul. So Jesus made it clear that the real issue is not external, but it was internal. It was going on, what was going on inside. It's not the washing of hands, but the purity of your heart that mattered. Listen to what, uh, what Jeremiah writes. He says, but I, the Lord, search all the hearts and examine secret motives. I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. I love this picture because he's like, I'm not looking at all the things you're doing, but I'm looking at your heart. And I think a lot of us know that, that God searches our heart. God looks at what's really important, the things that really matters in our life. And our choices should be telling us something about our hearts. That's what Jesus was saying. Whatever comes out is actually revealing what's going on inside. And so the choices that we're making in life should be revealing what's going on inside. The prophet Jeremiah also said, it's not in your outline, but he said, the, the heart is wicked and deceitful above all things. Who can know it? Because the truth is, I don't even know sometimes the things that I'm doing. Until it comes out, then I'm like, oh my gosh, that was in my heart. I realize that now. That I was turning away from you, God, or I was envious, or I was angry, or whatever was going on inside of my heart, and it came out, and then I'm like, oh, that was in there. And it became a sign for what was going on inside of us. It's telling us the actions that we're doing, the choices that we're making are telling us what's most important to us. Or perhaps that whatever it is is more important than God in our life. If you want to know what's important in someone's life, just look at the choices that they're making because the heart dictates how you and I will live. So when your heart is right, then we'll produce the type of living that God is looking for because whatever's in your heart eventually comes out. And it will determine how you live. And God is seeking those who has the right place in their heart. That's what Jesus, when he comes to this woman in a well, she's like, hey, uh, finds out, are you the Messiah that's coming? He's like, yeah. Well, they're telling us that we should worship in a certain area or in a certain way. And Jesus says, it's not always about how you do it, but what's in your heart. Listen to what he says. But the time is coming, and indeed it's here, it's here right now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. I'm looking for the ones who worship me in spirit in the truth and truth and the way they live their lives. The Pharisees were worshiping God in their action only. They weren't worshiping him with their hearts and they got tripped up on all these little silly things that they had made up. And so they missed out on the power of God. I think it's kind of interesting. I don't believe that anywhere in the gospels I've ever seen the Pharisees experience a personal miracle in their life. They never experienced a healing. They never experienced uh, a miracle happen, demons being cast out or anything like that in their family. None of them ever came. We don't see it anywhere in their life because they missed out on the power of God because they got focused on the wrong stuff. Check out what happens, though, when the heart is right. This next scene comes up. So Jesus, he arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and wanted no one to know it, but he could not be hidden. For a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. And the woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, 
And she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. But Jesus said to her, Let the little children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. And then he said to her, For this saying, go your way. The demon has gone from your daughter. And when she had come to her house, she found that the demon had gone out and her daughter lying in the bed. Man, I love this woman. What's not told here, but in Matthew, is that when he says the little children, he's referring to the children of Israel. So he's like, I've come here to, 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 to minister to the children of Israel, and you're a Greek, you're a, you're a Gentile, you're not part of that. So he says, I've got to focus on that. And then she has this amazing response, right? She hears the denial, but she comes right back. And I love this about her because she has this boldness in approaching Jesus. In fact, when she kind of approaches him in the book of Matthew, she's like, son of David, son of David, which was a messianic term for the son of God. And she's like, son of David. And his disciples are like, this girl is annoying us. Can you please send her away? And she doesn't let that deter her. She's like, no, no, no. I believe I'm going to push in with all my heart. So she keeps coming at him. And then Jesus, I mean, can you imagine if you prayed to Jesus and Jesus gave you an answer like that? Sorry, I don't got time for you right now. <laughs> Maybe after I listened to a hundred other prayers. What would you say, right? And it's kind of what he said to her. And she's like, yeah, but, but even the little puppies, and even the little dogs, he's like, I can't throw it to the dogs. He's talking about a house pet there when he said that to her. And she's, yeah, but even those little puppies are underneath the table getting the scraps from the kids. And Jesus loves this answer, and we love her for saying it. It's just like she, she eventually wins him over, and that's the next point in your outline is that a heart that is all in eventually overcomes. A heart that is all in eventually overcomes. This woman was all in because her heart was all in. She's like, I'm not giving up because I believe in Jesus. I believe in you. I believe you got the power to change my daughter, and I am in this because it's my daughter, right? How many of us would fight for our children for fight for the things that are in our hearts that are closest to us. You see, when your heart is fully in, that's when we go all the way. There's a scene in the Old Testament, a guy named Nehemiah. And he goes back, he lives about 500 years before Jesus, and the city of Jerusalem at the time is laying in waste, okay? Everything has been destroyed, every single building. And so he goes back to the city of Jerusalem, Jerusalem to rebuild the walls of the city so that those people that are living there will be protected. And it's the beginning again of the city being made whole again. And as he's there trying to build the walls, the surrounding tribes, the surrounding nations and the leaders around him are like mad at him. And they're like, if you build this wall, then you're going to be powerful and you're going to attack us back again. And we don't want that to happen. And so they're sending letters to King Artaxerxes who ruled the world at the time and they're doing all sorts of things. They're trying to invite him out so they can kill him and do all sorts of things. And they're all nervous that these people are going to keep attacking them. And so Nehemiah is thinking about it and the first thing he does, he says, you hold a sword while you're working and a shovel in one hand, a sword in the other. So they had a weapon in one hand and a shovel or a spade or whatever it is to lay bricks and do what they needed to do and lay those stones. But then he did something that was even wiser. He made each of those families build the wall next to their house. How motivated were they to make sure that that wall was completed, right? It's like, if they attack here, my house is here, I better make sure this wall is here, right? So they're working really hard. Why? They were all in. They were all invested. That's the point of being all invested. We're going to work extra hard. If our heart is in the right place, if our heart is invested in God, then we are going to go all in with the things that God has for you and me. When your heart is in it, you're more likely to overcome. You're more likely to be like this Syrophoenician woman who wasn't going to give up because the disciples said, go away, who wasn't going to give up because Jesus said, well, maybe not today. He's like, no, no, not leaving. Come on, Jesus. I know you got something more for me. Because when the heart is right, in the right place, we're going to be in line with God, what God wants us to do. There's a, there's, there's a verse in the Bible for the Jewish faith, for people who are Israelites. They believe it's the most important verse in the Bible. It's Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5, and it's called the Shema. And that the word is called Shema because that's the first word, which is here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These Pharisees really ultimately knew the most important thing, right? They knew that that was the most important thing. To put the Lord first in your life. If he's got your whole heart, 
If he's got all your strength and all your might, then he's got everything. And somewhere along the line, somewhere along that path, because they were trying to please God in some way or another, they got diverted and they came off wrong. You see, when God is at the center of your life, your life will turn out right. That's what the verse is telling us. That's what Jesus was trying to explain to them. If your heart is right, if he's at the center, then the rest of your life is going to turn out right too. You see, God wanted to put this down to memorize it, to never forget it. And the Jewish people have kept that as their verse. If you ask them today, what's the most important verse in the Bible, they're going to quote this one. When they ask Jesus what's the most important commandment, they're basically quoting this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, and with all your might. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself, right? And Jesus says, that's right. The whole commandment, the whole law, the whole prophets hang on this one important verse. You see, the complete and undivided heart is what takes us through the storms. That's the thing that helps us in the most difficult times because we stay focused on what God is doing. We stay focused on the God who says, I'm going to deliver. It takes us through the difficulties. It takes us through the times where our faith may be shaken when our heart has been devoted to God. And it's the key to overcoming in our life. John the Apostle, he wrote to people in their walk with Lord at different stages of their faith. He spoke to, he called them the little children, then the young men, and then the older people. And he had a different thing to say to each one. But he says this to them as he's, he's toward the end of this letter that he's writing. He says, in fact, this is love for God to keep his commands and his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. He says, overcome, overcome, overcome three times because he wants us to be overcomers. God wants us to be overcomers. And so God wants to encourage you and me. This is the message of the commandments because sometimes we look at the Old Testament and we go, what are all these commandments about? Why do we have to keep all these commandments? This is the lesson and the message of the commandments. If you want to be an overcomer in your life, if you want to discover the God of the universe in a personal way, if you want to realize God's purpose for your life, you have to go all in. That's the message of the commandments to all of us. Let's pray. God, I thank you for, for Mark who wrote all of this down for us. Lord, you chose particular people throughout history who were all in so that they could be overcomers and pass it on to us. Lord, that's what we want. Each one of us sitting here today wants all of you. We don't want half we don't want three quarters. We don't want 90%. Lord, we want all of you. Help us to understand that as we draw close to you, as we give you 100%, you're able to give us 100% back. Lord, thank you so much for meeting us because the truth is, even when we don't give 100%, God, you still love us. You still lead us to the place that we need to be at. Thank you, Lord, for never giving up on us no matter what. If we can just remain in attitude of prayer for just a moment. For some of us, maybe we've never made the decision to follow God. And, and what does that mean? I mean, what were the commandments doing? What was that all about? The commandments were showing us that we weren't perfect in front of God. We made mistakes. We blew it. We didn't do what he asked us to do. It's called sin. And that sin has created a barrier between us and him. And there's nothing we can do to take it away. But God did. God sent his son to die on a cross, to live the life, the perfect life we couldn't live, and to make a sacrifice for us and pay for that sin. And when we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, he gives us his perfect righteousness in place of our mess. And the way to do that is simply ask him into your heart, and so today, I'm going to pray a prayer, and if you want to join me, you can pray this too. In fact, I'm going to ask everybody just to say it out loud so no one has to pray alone. Lord God, I open my heart 
I invite you inside to be my God, my Savior, and my friend. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean. I've decided today to follow you from this day forever. I'm yours. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.